Welcome back, guys, to the JPS podcast. And in today's episode, we have a very special episode with the diet break debate. And Menno Henselmans and Jackson Pios battle it out as to who is closer to the truth in terms of their understanding of diet breaks. So in this episode, we start off by defining diet breaks. Jackson outlines the consensus of diet break research and what the current body of literature is telling us. We then discuss Menno's issues with diet breaks and we look at the mechanisms of actions for diet breaks and we conclude this episode with Jackson's recommendations on diet breaks as well as Menno's. So for those of you who weren't at the UABC, Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference 2019, on day three of the conference, there was a question asked about diet breaks and Jackson and Menno had a very interesting discussion which led to this debate. So if you wanna check out the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference and download all of the presentations, including day three with the two round tables and the Q&A sessions, you can. The UABC replay is available online for download simply click the link in the description box below and you can purchase pre-sale of the recordings at a discounted rate. So guys, enjoy this episode and here is Jackson Pios and Menno Henselmans. Welcome back guys to the JPS podcast and in today's episode we have Jackson Pios and Menno Henselmans and this is the diet break debate guys. If you weren't in Melbourne for the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference, We had to get security to intervene between these two guys. They were ready to neck each other and fists were going to be thrown. So this is the showdown. Stop smiling, guys. You're meant to be like super serious throughout this whole thing. Um, No, (laughs) but the guys had a very interesting discussion on day three of the Ultimate Evidence-Based Conference uh, and demonstrated that they have some differing uh, interpretations of the research on diet breaks. So we are here to flesh that out and hopefully get everybody closer to the truth. So given this is your field, Jackson, we're going to start with you. Um, Do you want to define what a diet break is? And then Menno will go over to you to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of the definition of a diet break. Um, So yeah, chaos. I think, I think it's better we start with sort of just defining intermittent energy restriction um, because within that we have both refeeds and diet breaks and, and sometimes these terms are used interchangeably. Um, so an intermittent diet is just a diet that's alternating a period of, of energy restriction or calorie restriction with a period of, of higher feeding. Usually this is to energy balance, sometimes slightly above. Now, um, like I said, these terms are used interchangeably, but usually when we're referring to to refeeds, we're talking about um, a a higher feeding period that lasts 24 to 48 hours. Um, Now, when we're talking about diet breaks, usually these are slightly longer. So sometimes sort of, if we're looking at the research, usually three days, sometimes up to two weeks. And and usually with with, with diet breaks, um, it tends to be focused around that energy balance level of calorie intake. Fantastic. Menno? Anything that you disagree with, want to add? No, that's good. I mean, it's a, a semantic definition, right? Uh, well, I, I would typically probably say that the way most people use a diet break, it's a week or longer, probably. Um, I mean, in, the, in like Byrne and um, uh, Wilson, did, which are probably like the most true diet break studies we have, it was a week or weeks even. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, we can define it as like three days plus is a diet break and up until then it's a, a refeed. Okay, fantastic. And Jackson, over to you. Let's talk about, I guess, intermittent calorie restriction. Uh, what does the research and the current body of literature um, allude to and what is the overall consensus with the benefits of refeeds and their rationale, uh, sorry, diet breaks and the rationale for using them uh, in practice? Okay, so so with intermittent calorie restriction, we sort of have two classes of, of dietary protocols. Now, if you're looking at the research, if you do a PubMed search on, on intermittent calorie restriction, um, typically you're not going to see the, the style of intermittent diets that, that sort of the athletes are using in practice. So you're going to see this type of dieting known as intermittent fasting. Now, this is not 
what we, me and you would consider as, as sort of this time restricted feeding. So this is not like a minimizing your feeding window or anything like this. The, the two major or the most common um, forms of intermittent fasting in the literature are something called the ADF, the alternate day fasting diet and the, and the five, two diet. So um, in the alternate day fasting diet, um, someone will consume zero to 500 calories on one day. So very severe um, energy deficit on that single day. And then they'll add, eat ad libitum on the following day and they'll just alternate that um, during the weight loss phase. Now the 5-2 diet is a, is a variant of that. Is that. Two days of the week you'll eat sort of super low, sometimes no calories um, for two days of the week. And then on those other five days, um, you'll eat ad, ad libitum or, or habitual diet. Now, the problem is that the current state of the intermittent calorie restriction research is heavily biased by, by these forms of, of, of intermittent diets. Now, we know that from the, the research, um, typically any dietary protocols that use extreme deficits, um, whether they're short or long, um, tend to not be favorable for athletes and they, and they tend to have um, inferior weight loss and fat loss efficiency, meaning the amount of fat or weight that's lost per unit of, of calorie restriction. Um, we also know that looking at some of the other studies um, with these ADF and 5-2 diets, um, typically the people that get um, sort of allocated to these groups tend to have um, more irritability, um, they find adherence more difficult, um, and the appetite seems to be stronger. Now, there's a number of review papers that have looked at intermittent calorie restriction and compared it to sort of, um, sort of our continuous calorie restriction where you'll just be in a deficit every day for the, for the duration of the weight loss phase. And the consensus that from um, the majority of these papers and, and these authors is that um, intermittent calorie restriction isn't any better um, than continuous calorie restriction from either a fat loss standpoint or, or a fat-free mass retention standpoint. But the problem with this is, like I said, that they're biased by somewhere around 90% of these studies in these intermittent calorie restriction reviews are using intermittent fasting protocols. Now, I don't know how many of your athletes are using the 5-2 diet or the ADF, or the ADF diet. I'd, I'd hesitate not too many. So I tend to not focus, when I'm, when I'm talking about refeeds and diet breaks, I tend to not focus on these review papers because I think they're limited in, the, in sort of the practical application that we have for athletes and training people. So what I tend to look at is the single studies that, that um, don't use intermittent fasting, still use intermittent calorie restriction, but, but it's, it's classed as something called intermittent moderate energy restriction. It's sort of a gay term, but that, that's what sort of, it was initially coined in, in the Matador study and it sort of trickled through a, a little bit more. And essentially what that means is that um, the period of deficit um, tends to be a lot more moderate. So we're not talking about these severe intermittent fasting practices. We might, might be talking a maximum of 30% um, deficit below, below maintenance. Um, and then this is alternated with sort of a diet break um, or, or a refeed. And we've probably got about six reasonable studies, um, only one that's used a trained, a relatively active um, population. Um, but from those six studies that have looked at sort of intermittent moderate energy restriction, um, they tend to there tends to be a benefit um, with the intermittent group versus a continuous group, and it tends to be um, better fat loss efficiency. Um, so they're losing more fat per unit of, of calorie restriction. Um, they tend to retain their resting energy expenditure at a slightly higher level. Um, from the studies that have monitored it, diet, dietary satisfaction seems to be a little bit better in, in the intermittent group. So the ones using um, refeeds or diet breaks um, and we've got one study that's looked at mood states, and it seems like mood seems to be a, a little bit more positive um, into intermittent group um, also. But like I said, um, we don't have a whole lot of studies that are looking at intermittent calorie sort of regimens that are applicable to athletes. Um, and we're sort of pulling from, from a couple of studies that, that, that all have their, their own limitations. Awesome. 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 Menno, over to you. Uh, what is your interpretation of the research and anything that you agree with uh, from Jackson's points or disagree with? Um, so, so what research now? I mean, um, I think we've mostly focused on um, intermittent energy restriction now, but not so much on uh, like actual diet breaks, like longer uh, breaks. Uh, so I definitely agree with what most people would probably call calorie cycling. Uh, is, is probably beneficial. Like, I think the research is, is very limited. Um, and I think Bill Campbell's study is probably the best one, but it ha hasn't been published yet. Um, so 
uh, that's you know left to uh, peer review scrutiny and the last time I talked to Bill at least um, uh, I think he wasn't sure yet if energy intake macronutrient intakes were the same between groups and how solid adherence was so that's always a, a big big issue with this research and even more so with uh, untrained individuals um, like most research on this is like an obese sedentary individual so there's people that don't don't really want to go on a diet and then they're sort of uh, put on a diet for a study and then you see like one of the diet break studies, um, I think, I think the Matador study, it was like 35 out of 50 people that followed the study per protocol, and that was super leniently defined as not gaining weight while they should actually be losing weight. So you know, adherence was still not not very uh, adherent. Uh, but yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Uh, there may be benefits to uh, to alternating. Uh, higher and lower energy phases and probably particularly in the um, having the higher calorie phases in the, the anabolic windows in the periods where protein synthesis is higher that theoretically makes the most sense uh, rather than you know randomly or on a rest day um, and it's hard to say what the mechanisms would be other than that facilitating more protein synthesis um, but yeah I definitely agree with that for the most part I might just jump jump in there, Jacob, and, and reference one study. Um, it was by Simon and colleagues, and, and it was a rodent study. Now, obviously, heavily limited in, in that we're using rodents, but um, one of the benefits of, of using rodents, which which addresses the limitation Mano was talking about, is, is we know exactly what they're eating, um, and we don't have to rely on sort of dietary reporting and, and, and those sort of things. Um, we also don't have to rely on honesty from the participants. Um, now, with this study by Simon and colleagues, um, this was a very similar protocol to the one that Bill Campbell set up, and I'm not sure if he sort of designed his protocol based on these findings. Um, but essentially, with what the rodents, with the rodents, they had a continuous um, calorie restriction group and, a, and an intermittent calorie restriction group um, who had a double day refeed every week. And th this study only went for about seven weeks, I think. Um, so they had the, at the end of the week they had double day refeed, but this wasn't sort of this was an ad libitum refeed. So that they they let the the mice eat as much as they want on on these two days. Um, now, after seven weeks, obviously, um, when you when looking at the energy intakes between the two groups um, over the trial, there was greater, significantly greater energy calorie intake um, in the intermittent group that was having the refeeds, um, but they lost the same amount of weight, exactly the same amount of weight. So this would translate to better weight loss efficiency, which is is one of the rationales I was talking about with these refeeds or diet breaks. So, like I said, the like like Menno says, the research is still heavily limited, but um, I think like when we know that the dietary reporting is solid and we and we can trust that, that what we're prescribing is what's going in, it, it looks like there still might be some benefits to, to refeeding or, or an intermittent protocol. Yeah, one issue with that though is then then uh, they were in less of an energy deficit, and we also know that there is an excessive deficit possible, which makes nutrient partitioning worse. Uh, like the um, studies from Norway by Garfedal, showing that in like. 30% deficit, the uh, one group was at athletes and athletes, 21st 30% deficit roughly, and then the 30% deficit group actually lost a bit less fat because uh, they lost muscle mass, whereas the 20% deficit group uh, was gaining muscle mass. So um, mm. then it, in, in that scenario, a refeed can basically act as um, um, as the, the way to make the deficit more optimal across the week as a whole. Mm. That's a, that's a solid counter argument. Yeah, no, great. And uh, Menno, it seems that one of your, uh, I guess, issues, for lack of a better word, with diet breaks is the potential for them to thwart adherence. And you mentioned in Melbourne that often at times people have a, a hard, uh, yeah, hard time getting back into the diet after a refeed. Uh, do you want to address that and why that might be the case? Yeah, so the, the original diet break study, uh, as I call it at least, was uh, Wing and Jeffrey from uh, 2003, 2001. And they, they, they sort of, it was weird because they sort of set out to argue that diet breaks would be bad. But they actually found that they, they weren't really detrimental in terms of statistical significance. There were not major differences between the groups. Uh, as a, at a group that did just continuous diets, one group did uh, like a long diet break or even Two, I think one one big one in the middle, and then there's one group that did three uh, diet breaks that were two weeks or so in length. Weeks, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and in the end, uh, overall results were 
uh, quite similar between groups. Um, but of course, the diet break groups took much longer. Um, um, or in this study, it was actually time equated, I think. But the continuous group basically stopped losing fat after like seven weeks. So they, if they had stopped, then the diet breaks would have spent much longer um, dieting. Um, but main thing for adherence is in this study that they found that, well, overall, statistically significantly speaking, uh, adherence didn't deteriorate. But there were trends uh, after most of these breaks uh, in, that there was some slight uh, weight regain. And after the break, many of the subjects reported that they had difficulty with um, restricting their food choices. And there were trends for uh, less frequent, um, I think it was self-monitoring, um, sticking with the food choices, and uh, some other routines and habits, which makes perfect sense because you have certain habits and routines that you get into. But if you go on a break and if you especially if you treat that break as something really different or a true break, like, oh, and I just get back to my old eating patterns and off the diet, then um, it really prevents you from ingraining these habits and making sustainable lifestyle change. So in, th in that sense, I think uh, the traditional argument for diet breaks that they improve adherence, which intuitively uh, would seem the case, uh, may actually not be uh, true for uh, many people. So I think that is a big concern, especially people that read about the benefits of diet breaks. And then they, they go on a break where they really have the idea of a break. Break's probably not the good, good term. Like Eric Helms said, practicing maintenance. That, that's, that's a good way uh, to put it, I think. Uh, but if you really go on a break, then you risk just uh, never achieving sustainable lifestyle change. Peacock, over to you. Um, I, I certainly agree with Menno that, that in, in many cases, diet breaks um, can be disruptive if you view them, if you view the diet break as sort of an opportunity to sort of um, progress towards your habitual diet or, or your pre-weight loss diet. Um, but if you view them as, as um, sort of practice at weight maintenance, sort of um, the, the disruption tends to get a little bit minimized. Um, and I also think a major issue when, when diet breaks can be disruptive is because um, individuals tend to, 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 to manipulate sort of their, their food choices based on palatability and, and, and satiety um, and hedonism um, because they've got sort of more carbohydrates or, or just more calories to play with. Um, so I made this comment before at, at the UABC, um, but you'll see it all the time where um, people on their low days or their low weeks, um, when they're fairly carbohydrate restricted, um, they tend to make food selections um, that involve sources that are sort of uh, low, very low palatability, um, high satiety, high volume, um, think like oatmeal, brown rice, things like that, um, vegetables. And then all, all of a sudden when, when the diet break comes around or the refeed comes around uh, and they've got this sort of extra 200 or 300 grams of carbohydrate to allocate, all of a sudden they, they, they start wanting to fit in sort of Rice Krispie treats and, and sort of low-fat ice cream. These these sort of foods that are sort of highly palatable, um, probably not not as satiating as sort of some other food sources that they were having on their low days. And, and when that happens, um, they're they're consuming foods that are sort of uh, uh, much more energy dense. Um, they're getting less food volume within the stomach, which we know food volume has an impact on satiety levels already. Um, and this, this palatability hypothesis and, and sort of the hedonism, the, the, the pleasure that we're getting out of what we're eating, when they have the, these nice tasting foods, they just want to eat a whole lot more of them. And that, that's when a refeed or a diet break can, tip, can quickly spiral into sort of a binge. And, and if, it's going to if it's going to spiral into a binge, um, it's very unlikely that you're going to be getting any benefits um, from the higher feeding period. Yeah, great. And so I guess the second issue that Menno outlined at the conference when you guys had a chat um, that he started to allude to there was the longer diet time frames when including uh, diet breaks and how that can potentially be problematic. So Menno, do you want to speak to that point in a little more detail? Uh, the second issue I brought up was actually that uh, he shouldn't bring scientific references to a fist fight. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, the, the, the time frame difference is, uh, I think uh, Jackson really pointed it out well here, that there were, uh, there's there, like a difference between a, a refeed or calorie cycling or intermittent energy restriction and um, maybe longer diet breaks, so like a, especially a week or longer. Um, because the main thing is, uh, one of the main benefits 
uh, theoretically of a diet break based on the research we have uh, from the Matador study, Bern et al. Uh, recently from 2018, which got really popular because it was published in Nature, um, is that supp supposedly the diet break group had better um, retention of their resting energy expenditure, so their metabolism didn't slow down as much. Uh, this was not true um, between groups in absolute level, but when they corrected for lean body mass, relative to lean body mass, there was less of a decrease in the diet break group compared to the other group. And it was uh, a bit less than 100 calories, I think 90 calories or so per day, uh, which is, was not nearly sufficient to explain the greater fat loss in that group, but it, it's, it's practically meaningful, I'd say. Um, but the question is, why is that the case? Because a lot of other research on uh, intermittent fasting and the like, alternate day fasting, basically comes to the conclusion that, um, or in fact, any, any research we have so far, that our metabolic rate is determined basically only by our current diet and our current body composition and activity level. So fast or slow weight loss before, whether you reverse dieted or didn't, uh, whether you've competed before or not, whether you've been fat before or not, all doesn't matter. It's just your current diet, your current body composition, uh, and your current activity level. Those determine your um, energy expenditure. So it's hard to see why there would be a benefit in terms of a diet break preserving uh, energy expenditure. So one, one, one big cue would be, oh, maybe it's body composition related. But in the Matador study, the, the diet break group actually lost non-significantly more fat-free mass than a non-diet break group. So that's not a possible explanation for why they retained a better metabolism. And I would think it probably has something to do with the, the uh, short pause of the deficit. So we know that adaptive thermogenesis, the re reduction in energy expenditure that occurs as you get leaner, as you're in energy deficit, this doesn't happen instantly. It's quick but not instantly. So it takes about three days for some of those changes in thyroid metabolism and like non-exercise activity from a genesis, uh, some change in the ner nervous system uh, that probably reduce spontaneous physical activity like fidgeting and the like and moving with my hands like I'm doing now. Uh, they, they, they take about three days to occur probably. So, or for to fully manifest, which means that maybe if we um, sort of intermittently have a higher energy intake day, maybe we can sort of slow down or prevent some of that metabolic um, adaptation. But that would mean that the benefit of the of a refeed would be the same as a diet break, basically. So you, if you break up the diet for, say, 72 hours compared to two full weeks, then the metabolic advantage of that, um, if that, that is the mechanism, would be the same. So there wouldn't be much of a benefit in having an extent, more extended diet break uh, and most of the benefit would already be achieved with calorie cycling or like a 5-2 uh, type diet. So that's a uh, main problem I have with the proponents of longer diet breaks. Like what's the mechanism of action? Why would it, uh, why would it help? Yeah. Um, so the, the criticism regarding the sort of there being no absolute change in resting energy expenditure in the Matador study. I've heard that thrown around um, a little bit, but we need to remember that the, the, the intermittent, the, sort of the, this diet break group is losing significantly more um, sort of body weight. There was, was 12.5 kilos of fat loss versus sort of eight kilos lost um, in the continuous group. So resting energy expenditure should be lower um, by function of, of losing more metabolically active tissue. So I feel like when, when we're trying to talk about discussions between sort of changes in, in resting energy expenditure um, between the groups, it should be account, it should be adjusted for, for, for changes in body composition. Um, now, Menno did say that, that it was only around 90, 100 calories difference. Um, but when looking at the kilojoules, that was, um, it was still uh, sort of, um, they lost they the diet break group decreased their resting energy expenditure um, half as much a, a, as a continuous group. So, like an absolute value, 100 calories is, is probably not that much, probably not that significant. How much is it going to translate into better fat loss? Um, well, that's we can't really say. Um, but um, the sort of the magnitude of difference is, is quite significant when 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 looking at the, the sort of the size 
because of the change um, between the two groups. Now, with, with the question, with the point, with regarding sort of how long should diet breaks last, and sort of is there a negative downside to sort of pushing it much further than seven days or, or something like that? Um, from memory and, and from speaking with um, Amanda Salas, who, who had a lot to do with the, the Matador study, um, their rationale for using a two-week diet break was that um, from papers, I believe, from um, Henry and Wing, um, they said that sort of it, on review of the literature, it looks like sort of 17 to 14 days um, adaptive thermogenesis takes to manifest. Um, so with that in mind, that's what, why they tried to prescribe sort of this two-week on, two-week off, two week off um, approach. Now, do I think two weeks is an optimal length of a diet break? Um, who knows, because this was the first probably solid diet break study that we've ever had. And that was one of the reasons why um, with, with my study, that I'm, my diet break study that I'm completing at the moment, um, which is three weeks dieting on one week diet break. Um, obviously, the downside of Matador is that it's doubling the length of the intervention. And, and sometimes with many athletes um, or anyone you're dieting down, you don't have the, the luxury of, of doubling the length of the intervention for them. Um, now, so what, what, I, what the question I was sort of asking is, was could, could we still see um, benefits of fat loss efficiency, better maintenance of, of resting energy expenditure if we set up a diet break protocol where the diet breaks were not as frequent um, and, and, and not, not as long? Because if we could still get benefits from a seven-day diet break that were comparable to a 14-day day diet break, well, then there'd be no, there'd be no real net necessity for, for extending the diet breaks that long. My uh, my point, by the way, for the, the the difference in resting energy expenditure was mainly uh, that the difference in fat loss um, is is not comparable um, or does not correspond with the difference in resting energy expenditure, because we can actually calculate how these two uh, change because we know what the metabolizable energy density of tissue is, so we know what actual energy deficit they must have been in to achieve their level of body composition change. We know what tissues they lost. So from that, we can calculate how much energy was lost from the body. And that, those figures are way, way higher. Like the uh, four, four kilo uh, extra uh, adipose tissue, that, that alone is, is, is like several fold higher than the, the difference that would be achieved by the 100 calorie uh, difference in resting energy expenditure. So the explanation the offers put forth, like the metabolism didn't decrease as much and that therefore they lost more fat, uh, that's impossible. It, it had to be adherence pretty much or physical activity or uh, something. But they're just the simple hypothesis, like you do the diet break, your metabolism doesn't slow, therefore your metabolism is faster, you lose more fat. Uh, those figures don't add up from the Matador study. So uh, there was a, a big adherence uh, issue there. Yeah, I, I would completely agree that the magnitude of change in resting energy expenditure isn't explanatory for, for the differences in fat loss. But if we just had this study to go on, I, I'd probably be a little bit more hesitant in the conclusions and, and statements that I make. But, but when we look at another paper by, by Davuti, which used 11-day deficit, three-day refeeding or diet break protocol, whatever you want to call it, um, compared with a continuous calorie restriction group, they also maintained a higher energy expenditure um, than the dieting group. Um, and we know in Campbell's paper, um, they also didn't decrease their resting energy expenditure as much in the refeeding group. So it seems like there's a little bit of a trend of at least some better maintenance of resting energy expenditure, whether that's the mechanism that's driving all these benefits that, that people are speculating in regards to diet breaks and refeeds. I don't know. Yeah. And uh, I guess to elaborate further on that point, what do you believe to be the primary mechanisms, Jackson, of action in terms of why diet breaks are seeing more favorable results in the research? Yeah, um, th this is highly speculative. Um, if we're putting sort of adherence aside, um, which could be a, a huge factor, um, where there's sort of this hormonal hypothesis that, that, that people like to throw around. And, and I think that the research um, on this is, is a lot weaker than, than most people assume. Um, now, we've got research that shows that up to 30% of resting energy expenditure can be dependent on, on thyroid hormones. And, and that was shown in a, in a paper by Silva. Um, we also know that um, when you're dieting, you get a decrease in circulating levels of thyroid. And upon um, restoration of, of energy balance, um, we tend to see sort of sort of 
practicing maintenance, go to make predicted maintenance calories, you tend to see a, a partial normalization towards baseline in, in thyroid markers. Um, now, there was, a, there was a study by Weinzier um, where they dieted people for 10 um, consecutive days and then they gave, then they maintained their body weight um, for 10 days following. Um, and we saw that after those 10 days of energy balance, we saw um, body composition adjusted, resting energy expenditure come back, come back to baseline, and also thyroid come back to baseline. Now, we know that thyroid has sort of this effect on thermogenesis and, and probably has some sort of driving force behind energy expenditure. So it's possible that thyroid could be involved. Now, the other one that people like to throw around is, is, um, is this leptin. Now, we had some overfeeding studies done sort of 10 years ago by um, Chin Chance, and they overfed guys for 24 hours um, with a bunch of carbohydrates um, after they'd gone through a dieting phase. And we saw that there was a short-term release of leptin into the blood, and it caused a 7% increase in, in total, total daily energy expenditure um, for 24 hours. And we also saw that this response in leptin, leptin was more sensitive to carbohydrate intake versus, versus fat intake. So this then drove a whole lot of speculation in sort of athletes and coaches that sort of you give someone a carbohydrate dominant refeed or diet break, you're going to get this massive ups, upswing in, in, in leptin levels and, and it's potentially going to sort of normalize energy expenditure and, and help with sort of normalizing satiety. But but the massive issue with with, um, with these leptin overfeeding studies is is it, it was an overfeeding, like they get, they're giving them a surplus. Now, um, we don't know that if sort of, establishing energy balance during a diet, so going to maintenance calories, is still going to have this same sort of um, release of leptin that's going to potentially lead, lead to some benefits because with these overfeeding studies, it's likely that this surplus of calories is going to lead to some sort of fat accumulation. And if you're in a weight loss phase, any potential fat accumulation during that refeed or diet break is probably going to outweigh any of the potential physiological benefits, which are probably only going to be minor at best anyway. Um, so I think people... Uh, extrapolating the, the leptin research a little bit um, more than they should be. And I'm, I'm not convinced that, that leptin is this sort of the key behind reef engine diet breaks. It could be involved. Um, but if you look at Bill Campbell's study, um, which Menno talked about, which hasn't been published yet, um, they looked at leptin and they only had a really small sample size for, for those analyses. It was only maybe nine people. But um, with, with that, that sample, they didn't see any differences in leptin. Um, now, with my study, I've got 60 athletes, and um, we're measuring leptin um, along the course of the study. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that we should be able to speak a little bit more confidently of how important is this leptin um, once we look at those results. Yeah. So I'd, uh, I, I can add to that. I generally agree with that, that thyroid is, is plausible. But from what we know, thyroid metabolism is really resistant and influenced mainly, mainly by acute body composition, not so much uh, the diet. So you can you can even fully suppress someone's thyroid for like years and then it will just bounce back up, not like uh, the issue with uh, hypogonadism. Like if you have someone on steroids, uh, their balls will basically shrink and die because the, the testes are not doing anything. Um, so the, the thyroid doesn't do that. It's, it's very resilient and very sturdy generally. So, you know, it, 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 it can still be the case that a small difference, because even a small difference in thyroid levels can have a substantial difference. Uh, for leptin, we, we have pretty good research showing that leptin responds to cumulative energy balance and total adipose tissue mass, because adipose tissue fat mass actually produces leptin. So it makes perfect sense that, again, body composition is a primary determinant of how much leptin you produce. Uh, and secondly, energy intake also seems to matter. Uh, and of course, those are two are very intricately related, right? Total cumulative energy balance over time and your body composition are, of course, one-to-one -one linked. So. With, with leptin, uh, the issue is, and that, that's probably a big issue in general with any intermittent calorie restriction research, is that the diet breaks slash refeed groups are in less energy deficit over time in the study period. Whether, because either they have maintenance periods or because they have the refeeds and at libitum energy intake. Um, so we, we know that leptin, uh, because it responds to cumulative energy intake, uh, it's likely that yes, it goes up if you overfeed, but it probably goes right back down when you underfeed afterwards. And there's no research supporting that you actually maintain on the same energy intake over time, you maintain more energy or leptin even uh, expenditure after the, the refeed, as soon as you go back into the same uh, energy deficit. So that over the time, over say the two week period with the, um, the refeed in the middle, your total energy intake is the same 
in both groups. So that's uh, a big limitation. I think leptin is, is a very unlikely candidate uh, to explain much uh, of the benefits. Mm. Yeah, I, I would agree. And uh, like, I'm not convinced that it plays no role. Like there was a study by Rosenbaum um, a little while back where they showed that low dose sort of pharma pharmacological leptin um, injections increased REE and, and helped to restore circulating thyroid. Now, obviously we can't take pharmacological administration and translate to that to being sort of the leptin response following like a carbohydrate refeed or, 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 or a diet break or something like that. But it shows that it at least has some sort of role um, and it might just be permissive. Um, but I think it's, it's good to keep in mind that um, like while the biggest driver of leptin levels is going to be sort of um, the amount of adipose in the depot, um, leptin does respond to short-term nutrient flux also. Um, like there, there was a paper that I just, uh, I was sent only a couple of weeks ago um, and it hasn't been published yet. It's by Risotto um, from memory. And it was, it was again on rodents, um, and they gave them 14 days of diet. Um, so they, they lost weight um, during this period. Their, their testy weight decreased, their sperm count decreased, um, and IGF leptin and resting energy expenditure decreased. Um, they then gave them a seven-day refeed um, after this period, and they showed that, that all of these markers, including leptin, had returned to baseline while body composition had not returned to baseline. So they hadn't put the, the fat back on yet, but... Um, the, these other markers like leptin and, and, and IGF, that they'd, they'd come back to normal. So it shows that, that, that leptin, while it might not be playing a bigger role as most people think, um, it's responding based on the state of, of sort of energy balance and not just relative fatness. Yeah, I agree. But it's cumulative energy intake based on the research we have. So the, the issue is like I, I do 100% agree leptin will matter and leptin will go up during overfeeding. The question is, Will it not just go right back down when you underfeed again and you end up with the same energy intake over the, the time period? I think that will be the problem. Mm. Yeah, it's a super valid question. Um, and that's why um, I think one of the benefits or advantages of my study is we're measuring leptin sort of at the start of a dieting block, at the end of a dieting block and, uh, and after the end of a diet break. So to see like, because if leptin pops up for maybe like a day after the diet break, is it going to translate to sort of physiological benefits probably mm -hmm. not but, but if it was like a potent that was lasting sort of the, the duration of the of the dieting block then, then maybe it has some merit because as far as i know no, no one sort of looked at a time course it's, they've just sort of looked at the 24 hours post like a, a, a overfeeding period oh. awesome awesome so yeah. yeah i guess the jury's out on whether this temporal elevation in leptin is going to have any significant impact on uh yeah longer term outcomes. So I guess that was a very productive discussion and the way I wanted to sort of wrap up this debate uh, was to run through each of your uh, recommendations regarding diet breaks. So we'll start with you Jackson. Uh, firstly, what are your general recommendations for the duration of a diet break? So how many days? Um, going by research, um, the duration of a diet break is probably going to be seven to 14 days. Um, but we just, we really don't have much research to know if that's going to be an optimal setup. Mm -hmm. um, in practice, um, you can possibly get away with sort of a one week diet break only every four to eight weeks or something like that. Um, and I, knew, I know that's way more common in sort of the bodybuilding circles um, and, and in the fitness community. It just hasn't been looked at in, in the research just yet. Awesome. And based on our discussions, uh, how should a diet break be structured in terms of both calorie, macronutrient intake and food choices? Just what are your general recommendations there? Yeah. So my recommendation when, when implementing diet breaks is to keep food sources um, the same as, as what you're doing on your low days or your low weeks and just increase portion sizes. Um, I... In, in terms of sort of the, the calorie intake, um, you want to be as close to sort of um, ma maintenance or predicted maintenance calories as you can be. Um, obviously, this requires some pre-planning at the start. Um, 
of, of of the dieting phase. If you're six weeks into the into a diet and you just plug your stats into a, a sort of a TDE calculator, you're gonna, you're going to be way off. Um, so it requires some pre planning at the start. But in a perfect world, um, establishing energy balance, so eating enough calories to maintain your body weight. And if you had to choose, decide on going on one side of the other, you'd probably want to slide on a slight surplus just because um, from the literature we do have, it seems like um, when people increase calories, but it hasn't, it's still in a state of deficit, it hasn't established energy balance, um, we tend to not see any um, sort of restoration or normalization in some of the, um, some of the markers we're trying to recuperate. Um, I also think that there's... Uh, relatively weak basis or moderate basis for um, when increasing calories during these periods to, to allocate the majority of them from carbohydrate. Um, now, we, we talked about the leptin research being, being highly skeptical, but we do know that leptin is more sensitive to carbohydrate intake than it is to fat intake. We also know that carbohydrate replenishes a depleted glycogen, glycogen stores. Um, now, with a more saturated um, state of, of, of muscle glycogen there is some research that suggests um, the individual can tolerate and recover from higher training volumes um, and there is some weak research to suggest that when carbohydrate availability is higher uh, the anabolic response to weight training might be a little bit more profound awesome and final question which you kind of answered but how frequently can and should diet breaks be implemented um, in a perfect world where possibly you had an open-ended prep or an open-ended weight loss phase where you didn't have um, sort of a hard end date, um, somewhere, somewhere around, if, if we're going purely by the research, um, every two to three weeks, you'd be diet breaking. Um, if we're going by what I think would be better in practice, um, probably every four to eight weeks. Awesome. Awesome. Menno, over to you. Is there anything you want to add or comments on in regards to that? Uh, well, I don't implement many diet breaks. Uh, so my main advice would be first, uh, before before you consider implementing one, uh, to take a, a long, hard look at your current diet and, and why you feel you need diet break. Because physiological benefits, potential physiological benefits aside, if you, especially if you're doing it for adherence or you feel you, you really need a break, I think it's much more important to look at why what you're doing now is not sustainable because it will be just as hard after the diet break. Okay, awesome. And in terms of general recommendations for the duration of a diet break, so how many days, uh, if somebody is going to take a diet break, uh, how long do you recommend? Uh, generally, I, I'm a big proponent of um, the use of intermittent fasting for some individuals. Uh, I like calorie cycling a lot, especially uh, aligned with the anabolic window, so more calories uh, generally uh, after training sessions and especially in the period between a workout and, and bedtime uh, and also more generally than on training days versus rest days um, but that aside I think sustainability and the like are, are much more important the only scenarios where I ever um, do a practicing maintenance uh, as I now like to call it because of Eric Helms okay. uh, phase is when uh, I feel a diet is really going in the wrong direction and sometimes during contest prep, because contest prep is by definition not sustainable. Okay. So it, it's fine if you then really need a, a break, because you know if you if you need a diet break to get down to 10%, I say there are issues with the diet, because it, it shouldn't be that hard. But if you need a diet break to get down to 5%, okay, you know that f getting down to 5% is brutal. So if you need a break, a few breaks even to do that during contest prep, that, that's perfectly fine. Um, so I think then there, there is more of a, a rationale for a bit longer breaks, like a week. Week is probably good because, you know, most things function on the Gregorian calendar uh, and a week is just, it's a very um, practical measure. Uh, two weeks is probably is probably pushing it and you may risk uh, losing habits and the like. Um, so I, I'd probably do them for a week uh, in that case. Uh, and when I see a diet, is uh, what I first refer to when I see a diet really going in the wrong direction of someone, uh, there's probably... Uh, also implementing methods that are not sustainable, even though they, they now think they are, then I will use the diet break really as um, a lean bulk. I will not use it, the term diet break. I will just say like we do like a mini mini bulk uh, for one or two weeks and see how that goes to see if what we're currently doing now is sustainable and not just 
uh, a path to a binge that comes afterwards, what you often see with contest prep. Awesome. And in terms of structuring the diet break, you sort of mentioned uh, about calorie intakes and the you know post-workout uh, anabolic window and things like that. But in terms of calorie macronutrient intake uh, and food choices, what are your recommendations there? Um, similar to Jackson, probably as, as similar as your regular diet. Um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even err towards higher carbohydrate intake. Just keep it as similar to your regular diet uh, as otherwise. Okay, and by that do you mean sort of increasing all macronutrients proportionately? Is that what? Yeah, fat, fat and carbohydrate proportionately. Like okay. protein intake, you can increase, uh, but you shouldn't need to. Uh, otherwise, you are consuming too much, too little protein uh, before. Awesome. And how frequently uh, can and should diet breaks be implemented, Menno? So you sort of mentioned on a needs basis in a contest prep, um, but just some recommendations you have there. I don't think there's there's never a theoretical need, um, but they they can be done as needed pretty much during mm-hmm. contest prep. Like if if like if it's like the Matador study where you're basically spending as much time diet breaking as as cutting, then you know that that is problematic. But if really needed, like if that was was needed to get someone in contest prep, and you have like eight months to get ready for a show, and uh, you're already pretty lean, then you know that that could be uh, viable. Awesome, awesome, guys. Well, thank you very much for this discussion. It wasn't really a debate. Um, <laughs> people who have listened this far in are probably going to be yeah highly disappointed that there were no punches thrown. Um, but I've why got. To, uh, why do we swear at each other? Yeah, I know. I've got. I've got that image of you both, with, with the f- fists ready to go, and it's going to be great. Hopefully, uh, all the hype will um, get people to learn a little bit more about type rate. Click back. That's it. That's it. No, but thank you both for coming on. I think it was a very productive conversation. Um, you both outlined some great points, and I'm sure it was very informative and educational for the listeners. So thank you both for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks, man, and thank you, Menno. You too, and good luck with your study. And I hope both of our studies will uh, provide more answers on this. Um, and who knows, maybe we'll both have different opinions uh, in a year from now. Yeah, it should be very cool. For sure. Awesome, guys. So I'll stop.